Now that I'm in your home, I can tell you, tonight we get twisted. I'm Sandra Bernhard, your hostess for this nonstop psycho a go go. As always, our classic underground films are chopped up to show only the racy parts, chopped being the operative word for this show. When tonight's characters can't get the girl, they stalk and kill her. A lusty Satan needs satisfying. They sacrifice virgins, though you never hear about anybody sacrificing male virgins, do you? They probably can't find any guys to admit it. But cheap exploitation films often feature plots that prey on women. Take our first film, Hot-Blooded Women. It's pure Texas trash, directed by troubled loner Dale Barry. Beverly Oliver stars as the naughty exhibitionist whose idea of a come-on is a vigorous frug on the counter of a local fish shanty. By the way, Buxom Beverly says she was underage when she was doing that frug back in 1965. Only her sense of rhythm appears underdeveloped. Here's hot-blooded women. I'll never forget this girl, this pathetic, loveless, miserably sick, Myrtle Pennypacker. Let's go, Myrtle. No, oh, leave me alone, damn it. You're out of your mind, baby. Oh, leave me alone. And I'd like you to show off like that. Hi, you stud. Why haven't you called me? Cool it. rather violent, but settled down when she realized that we were not going to lock her up. I spoke to my assistant, Dr. Cuttlemeyer, and ordered complete physical and neurological tests and reports as soon as possible. The first thing, of course, was to administer a sedative and see that Myrtle received sufficient rest. 
looming large was the problem of George. Myrtle cried for him constantly. George called me on the phone every hour on the hour. Almost every waking thought of Myrtle concerned the welfare and the whereabouts of her husband. But I was afraid to allow visits at this time. Okay, girls, time for an out. Let me have the baby. Mr. Pennypacker and I met the detectives, and I related how Myrtle had been a patient as well as the details, so far as we knew them, of course, of her escape. How old was she? What was she wearing? What does she look like? How tall? How long? How broad? Okay, now give me the gun. You wouldn't shoot me. Drop that gun, you broad. Drop it. I loved it when Myrtle taught that girl not to mess with her man. She completely stretched out her cashmere sweater set. Now there's a case where the punishment fits the crime. And quick thinking. The way the henpecked Mr. Pennypacker anticipated Myrtle's brutal knife attack with a bed full of pillows? <laughs> I've used that trick myself. Afterwards, the lovemaking was terrific. In fact, the memories are flooding back. I may need a quick break here to compose myself. Next on Real Wild Cinema, a homicidal maniac loose on the streets of New York City. Where do they get those crazy ideas? Who are you? What do you want? Don't make any noise and you won't get hurt. Touch that dial and I'll kill you! Real Wild Cinema will be right back. What is it about guys named Tony? They're always little guys with a five o'clock shadow and a chip on their shoulder. Am I offending all you Tonys out there? Oh, maybe if you'd stop treating women like meat and get over that Napoleon complex and find another job besides mob hitman, you'll stop making the name Tony a dirty word. Next, our 1965 masterpiece, The Sex Killer, is about a deranged dreamboat named, you guessed it, Tony. Yes, he already has a girlfriend, though she's not very leggy and she's real stiff. Okay, she's actually the head of a mannequin. But he works at a mannequin factory and maybe there's just no policy regarding inner office romance. Hey, Tony. You're late back from lunch. What happened? Nothing. What do you got there? Hey, let me see. It looks like a pair of binoculars. Come on. Hey, those are beauties. I bet that costs a lot of dough. No. What are you going to do with them? Nothing. Nothing. I bet you're going to look at girls out your window, eh, Tony? Those girls are dressing across the street? <laughs> no, I'm going to look at birds in the woods. Ah, birds in the woods. 
Hi, Tony. Can I have a drink with the boys tonight? No, I don't think so. Man, you don't have to have any fun. Yeah, I did. Imagine this. This guy goes right in the girl's apartment and kills the girl. He's too much. Yeah. Hey, Tony. Tony?
You won't believe what I just heard. What happened? You know, Tony, the stock clerk? Yeah. This guy's the sex killer. No kidding. Really, I just heard it on the news report on the radio. I'm gonna go tell the rest of the fellas. Tony, I can't believe it. It's some little guy like that. What a funny guy. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, Strange how Tony's co-workers seemed so unconcerned when hearing the news of his death. I guess they were too caught up in polishing their phallic plastic arms. Next on Real Wild Cinema, another kook bent on maiming women. Gives me the shivers when I think of that killer loose somewhere. I'm gonna get dressed. Will she get fully dressed before the attack? Will her goosebumps go away? The suspense is killing us. More psychos and my guests Herschel Gordon-Lewis and David Friedman after this. When our next film, Blood Feast, opened in 1964, the Los Angeles Times called it a blot on the American film industry. Real wild cinema viewers know that's high praise indeed. We're honored to have with us the makers of Blood Feast and the dynamic duo of sexploitation films, director Herschel Gordon-Lewis and producer David Friedman. Thank you, gentlemen. It's good to see you again, David. Good to see you, Sandra. And how did you two Twisted Souls meet? I had an independent film distributing firm in uh, Chicago. And one day a young man came in and said, I'm making a picture. And I said, oh, yeah? And he said, but this is different. I have the money. I said, come in. Oh, I bet. <laughs> that was the only way to keep score. And, and that was you. That was, that was, yeah. that was Herschel. Oh, that's unbelievable. That was Herschel. And from that hour on, we became close friends and later on collaborators. Extraordinaire. Was that your intention to really become a team? Well, we happened by accident as many twins do. <laughs> Separate. You weren't separated at birth, we right? Were, no. At the rump, yeah. The uh, idea really was to get a picture that people would play. In those days, uh, one lived or died as an independent producer with theatrical. Mm -hmm. Today we have cable, we have video, video. cassette, and some mm -hmm. of these pictures are released directly onto cable. We right. didn't have that, that luxury. Right. So we had to go into these theater owners who were a scurvy bunch to start with, <laughs> and uh, convince them to throw out the Ten Commandments and Ben-Hur, and to throw in Blood, blood Feast. Herschel, you actually invented stage blood. Tell I, us the secret <laughs> ingredient. Did you get a patent? Well, I hope we don't get sued from the, by some of the, our, our former actors and actresses. We came to the conclusion that the stage blood that existed was too purple. It didn't right. look like real blood. Right. So off we went to a little cosmetics laboratory in Coral Gables and compounded our own. And it looked so much like blood, if you had a transfusion, you'd think nothing of it. Of course, you would die, but you would think nothing of it at the moment of death. But the key ingredient in there was kaopectate. We never told the actresses Are you that. kidding? <laughs> that had some value. They had to ingest the blood. They had to ingest the blood. It might not staunch the bleeding, but it would bind them up a little. Yeah, right. <laughs> they were constipated. But a funny story, our stage blood was very hard to get out. So we usually made that the last scene, after which the actresses were to be thrown away. <laughs> Hold on, we're going to go to Blood Feast now, the film which revolves around murdered virgins in Florida. Very hard to find. Is that what happened to all of them? And now, some tragic local news. We have a report of another murder tonight. Police request that all women stay inside their homes after dark. If you must go out, Are you Mr. 
Mr. Ramses, I heard about you from a friend of mine, Annette Dupree. I'm giving a dinner party in two weeks for my daughter, and Mrs. Dupree said that you cater to just the type of thing I'm looking for. I want uh, uh, something unusual. Have you ever had an Egyptian feast? Why, that would be fine. That would be perfect. Then I can leave everything in your hands. Now, this is my card. The name and the address are right there. I'm mailing out invitations for two weeks from Saturday night. You can have things ready by then? Things have been ready for a long time, Mrs. Fremont. A long time. Uh, I, be I beg your pardon? Uh, uh, well then, uh, good day, Mr. Ramsey's. Two weeks from Saturday night, uh, 630 sharp. It's getting late. Shouldn't we be getting back? Prove you love Killer loose somewhere. I'm gonna get dressed. Jay, Suzette, do you know what type of party your mother has planned? I think it's gonna be an Egyptian feast. Doesn't that sound exciting? Did you set out with Bloodfeast to make films that you'll be remembered for? 
Well, we didn't want that on our epitaph. <laughs> you don't want that on your tombstone, right? <laughs> the concept was to make a motion picture that the major companies either couldn't make or wouldn't make, which was a lot easier then than it is now, because now all the barriers are down. That's right. So Dave and I set out and made a list of possible subject matter, some of which was just too grotesque to even consider. But there Probably isn't it, anymore. You guys should, anymore. You guys should You're come right. back, you know? But leaping out at us like a new comet in the wilderness was that wonderful four-letter word, gore. <laughs> now, here's a question I just want to know. Did you ever want to do a mainstream film? Did you ever want to really be accepted in Hollywood? Well, those are not the same question. <laughs> you're, you're right. I'm, it's a two-parter. <laughs> We've always had the impossible dream, yes. but uh, it just never came our way. The, we were categorized. We were pigeonholed. I can relate to the that. The only... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the thing, though, that we both had so much fun while we were making these things. We, yeah, we made some money with them, but more than that, it was the fun. And it was fun then, it was fun watching them being made, it was fun seeing people go see. And here we are now, 30, 35 years later, and we're having fun talking about them. And you guys are still talking. And we're which still talking. probably wouldn't be and, happening if you were a Hollywood And duo. people still write to us and ask about the pictures, and they're seeing them now on, uh, on video. And it's uh, great. there's yeah, a whole new audience. And we no longer get hate mail. I'm sure you don't, honey. Because your films oh, are, originally we are, got mellow, oh, are mellow oh, compared yeah, to well, what's coming out now. We were groundbreakers. We were the fountainheads of this disastrous kind of this category of film. And we once got a whole bag full of letters the same day, obviously written by some group, because they all referred to us as you reckless men spelled W-R-E-C-K-L-E-S-S. -S. <laughs> always, always an upscale crowd. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Those are our people. Well, but they were also our customers. Yeah. Well, so there you go. They went to see it. They just couldn't quite get completely behind it. But we're behind you a thousand percent here on Real Wild Cinema. So stay with us. For a man so hungry, he not only cleans his plate, he eats it too. I'll be right back. Thanks, guys. Stay with us. There's lots more real wild cinema coming up. I never like to go out on a dinner date. Don't like to chit chat, can't stand to watch people eat. But our next clip from Mondo Bizarro features a suave Italian sharp dresser, kind of guy you'd bring home to mom. Just be sure she hides the good china and insist on no tongue for the good night kiss. Here's the glass eater.
Next on Real Wild Cinema, more psychopaths demonstrating a general lack of social graces. And for those of you who wouldn't know a psychopath from any other demented nutcase, here's a little lesson. See you in a bit. This is the puzzle of a man and of a whole category of conditions where crime and the disordered mind are related. We're concerned here with the psychopath, the man without a conscience. He is of the gravest concern to criminologists and to psychiatrists, all those interested in antisocial behavior. If a man can't distinguish between right and wrong, is he sick and ought he to be in a mental hospital? Or is he a criminal and should he be locked up in jail? These are the questions that come up time and time again in this case. This man has served a term in the penitentiary. He has been in a psychiatric ward. The police know him as a convicted burglar. The psychiatrists call him a psychopathic personality. This is the psychiatrist, Dr. Henry de Ross, who has worked with the puzzle of this man. Does it ever bother you when you do something wrong? Well, I'd never regret it before. I'd only regret it afterwards, particularly if I was caught. This is Bob Botas' store and postal station that he broke into. Inspectors were notified and uh, from the postal authorities when they came in and we went through the invent inventories, we discovered that over $1,700 worth of stamps were missing. This is Detective Sergeant McKenzie who arrested him. And I, I find him, in my experience, he was a very strange chap and uh, a very smart man with a check, uh, especially non-existent accounts. This is the Federal Training Center, where he served most of his penitentiary term under Deputy Warden Laferriere. No, no, never, never. He was never a disciplinary problem. This is the building where he reported to his probation officer, Bill Connell. I've lost track of the number of jobs I got for him. Maybe 15 different jobs. And the question comes, where does he, where does society go next? What do you think the chances are of your getting into further trouble like you have up to now? Serious trouble? No. If we're going to restrain and treat psychopaths and other offenders whose basic problem is a disordered mind, what we need is a combination hospital and jail where the man can be isolated and kept away from society where he can't help getting into trouble, where he can be treated if this is possible, but most importantly, where he can be studied so that we can prevent this happening in others. Real Wild Cinema will be right back. In 1959, a year before Alfred Hitchcock gave us the shy and sensitive Norman Bates in Psycho, Richard Hilliard brings us the shy and sensitive mirror-drawing freak in The Lonely Sex. It's the first of three rapid-fire triple features, including 1963's Mondo Pazzo and the 1934 feature Tomorrow's Children. But first, we finally found a nutcase who's perfectly content to have a date with himself in The Lonely Sex. We keep sending out our wireless signals, trying to make contact. Here I am, we say. Come and help me. Because you know, my friends, we all need help. We are all afraid of something. None of us is able to stand alone. We all need someone else. And now I want to read you another letter from one of our listeners. This one from Miss E.T. of Chicago, Illinois. She says, sometimes I cannot believe there should be so many happily married people in the world when I am so alone. Through your program, I've learned to hope eternally that I will find the right man someday. And every night when I go to bed, I pray that someday I will meet him. Until I do, my life is a deep well of sorrow. I cannot thank you enough for the wonderful words of wisdom. This pretty little girl might be the one you met just yesterday. She might be the girl you'll meet today or tomorrow. 
By the desert of our soul, it's going to spring into bloom. The waters of love are going to gush forth, and the river of happiness is going to roar through that valley. Our soul is going to be filled with the sparkling and laughing of many streams, leaping in the sun and laughing with love. And the flowers are going to burst into bloom in a majesty and joy we have never known before. Why, from here I can see them stretching out as far as the eye can see. It's rush hour, 10 automobiles per second on six lanes. 600 automobiles a minute, minimum permitted speed, 50 miles per hour. Seven road signs in 100 yards, 123 and one half road signs every mile. One six concerning hysteria and madness after 24 hours driving in this hell are not available. We must admit, however, that today America has a good safety valve for hysteria and madness. In the quiet motels just off the main roads at nodal points, more and more of these little cinemas are to be found. Here, the driver can relive on the screen the incidents of the day's journey while his resentment is still fresh and let off steam in certain reactions that the traffic cops might consider, well, rude. They are psychological decompression chambers, where for $1.50 the driver has the right to a front seat and six pounds of bad tomatoes, the amount the psychiatrist considers sufficient for a satisfactory decompression. Stuart, you are to be transferred to one of the state hospitals for immediate sterilization. Next case. You understand, nurse, I, I want the boy to look just as nice as possible. His case will be up before the judge in just a few minutes. Now keep him perfectly quiet. All right, Senator. Ah! What are you doing? Ah! What have I to do? Quiet, fool. Put a bow on quickly. Coming up, women who bathe in blood. Vampires who shop at Fredericks of Hollywood and confessions of a psycho cat. This is the beginning of an unholy nightmare. Confessions of a psycho cat. Real Wild Cinema will be right back. Okay, granted, most movie psychos are men, but who says women can't slash and kill and go berserk too? Watch these trailers to see how it's done. This is the beginning of an unholy nightmare. Confessions of a psycho cat. Strange compulsions, desires unparalleled, unspeakable urges. Their confessions run deep. Their actions are those of a hunter stalking his prey. What secrets are harbored deep within the sinister highways of the mind? What are the confessions of the psycho cat? <laughs> confessions of a psycho cat.
the world's most prolific murderess was the Countess Elizabeth Bathory. By her own count, she butchered 610 young virgins. Fact or fiction? Was she a grotesque vampire stalking prey in the dark of a moonless night? Or a depraved mind seeking victims for a macabre ritual of the occult? <coughs> Carl Zimmer, Count of Bathory and husband to Elizabeth, was he an inhuman vampire seeking blood to sustain his life? Or was Carl Zimmer a malevolent creature capable of loving only the victims of his own hand? What do you want of me? The true story of the Countess Elizabeth Bathory, as taken from court records and eyewitness accounts of her trial, the Holy Court found the Blood Countess guilty of 610 murders of young maidens. The Holy Court, either through fear or negligence, failed to probe into Elizabeth Bathory's motives. Certain evidence would show that Elizabeth Bathory was a malevolent vampire, requiring the blood of living women to sustain her life. Other facts recently made available points to a much more hideous conclusion. These facts would show the Countess Elizabeth Bathory to be a diabolical handmaiden to the devil, serving her master Satan in a grotesque sacrament of the occult. We will present to you the evidence, and you shall be the judge. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Why doesn't that mirror-kissing psycho from the first trailer just pair up with a mirror-kissing psycho from the lonely sex? Then they wouldn't be lonely anymore. I love love. We'll have more strange compulsions, desires, unparalleled and unspeakable urges next time on Real Wild Cinema. Good midnight to ya.